Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Business Brains Podcast. Today, we are pleased to have on the show, dare I say a legend in the Canadian advertising industry, a man who actually comes from an advertising family. He's a copywriter by trade and rose to become the creative director of some of the biggest ad agencies in the world, including DDB Canada and Sharp Blackmore, amongst others. He's worked on brands such as Labatt, Suzuki, Dell Computers. He's been on the jury at Cannes. He's a champion rower, a snappy dresser, a great follow on LinkedIn, a father of four, and he is never, ever sick at sea. Welcome to the Business Brains Podcast, Mr. Tony Miller. Thank you very much, Paul. I don't know about the snappy dresser part today. I, I should have. I, should have. <laughs> I wrote that before I saw you. I'm sorry. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction. Well, every time I, when I had my interview with you, you were dressed very snappy and I noticed it. So I thought, oh. That was a good day. So there yeah. you go. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. But uh, more, more of a relaxed possible um, dressing situation now. So Yes, exactly. Well, okay. I am at home. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, Tony Miller, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Great, great. Thank you for having me, Paul. I appreciate uh, the invitation. All right, man. Um, so you've had a, a long and storied career in advertising. One of the greats. You know everyone. You've worked with everyone. You've worked on everything. So could you just give us a little bit of your origin story? Because your father wasn't um, an ad man, possibly a madman. We're not sure. But uh, yeah, kind of, kind of take us, a young Tony, you know, scurrying around his father's knee. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, I learned at the feet of the master. Uh, yeah. you know, so dad was uh, in, he was a creative director, an art director, and a copywriter writer over the years. He was a Montreal boy, and he, he uh, ended up being a creative director at McLaren in Montreal and then moved to Toronto. So I spent a little time when I was young in Montreal. Not very, I don't remember it. I was too, too young. Mm -hmm. But I was at Expo 67, so I can say that. Um, right. And yeah. So, and then he, uh, we moved to Toronto and he was made creative director at McLaren here in Toronto. And so I was always surrounded by advertising and, and knew it and knew that he was doing it, though uh, he never pushed me in that direction. Uh, he was a great writer and I, you know, all of my essays in school were, were well crafted and well written because dad would take a look and go, try this, try that. And, um, so I went to U of T and I studied political science and history and I answered a, an ad from Ogilvy and Mather that was in the career center. It was for, to be a media buyer at Ogilvy and Mather. And I said, asked my dad what he thought of that. He said, well, see if you like the business, do it, but see if you like the business. If you like the business, then, you know, you can find your place in it. Right. So it was good advice. And I, I, I met some great people at Ogilvy and, and enjoyed it somewhat, but thought to myself, well, this isn't perfect for me, but I really think those account executives look cool and they're on a cooler floor. The way Ogilvy was set up was, you know, the media department was on some sort of grim kind of Orwellian floor. And I, the, you go up to the account service floor and it was like red carpet and it was kind of this back an alien situation up there. So it was all very cool. And I thought, well, that's what I want to do. So I was taking the cap course at the time. And um, I met someone who said, Oh, well, our agency's hiring, uh, you know, account executives. So you may be interviewed for that. So that was SMW. And I, I got a job as a, an account exec there. And I spent a couple of years there. And I did enjoy it much more because you got to meet clients and, and, uh, and learn about the accounts from that angle and i've always had a uh, a soft spot for account people because i spent a i walked a mile in their suit in their shoes and see how tough it is um but i looked up the food chain and i saw that you know what awaited in that career path was you know variations on a theme and and highly detail oriented and so on and i had a more of a creative a flair and i i enjoyed writing and i was at another agency by this time and um put a portfolio together and showed it around and i was able to um get a job as a writer at that same agency which was axsmith mcintyre vict which doesn't exist anymore it, that sounds made up that sounds made up. does Go totally ahead. sound made up but it was, uh, it was some lovely people and uh, it used to be camp advertising then became that and now it is evolved to become agency 59 which still exists and um and, there, and John McIntyre, the creative director there, let me um, uh, become a writer at the agency, which was awesome, and I loved it. And went from there, 
uh, to work for Ranscom and Company. Jim Ranscom saw my book, and Jim is, ex- is an exceptionally talented creative uh, mind and creative director and writer, and really uh, was a mentor for me, teaching me how to co- be a great copywriter and, and what it took to do that. And so many talented people went through Ransom and Company that are still in the business today. Lance Martin, Hayes Steinberg, Siobhan Dempsey, Les Seuss, I could go on. There's, there's so many. Uh, Andrew Manson, Blaine Kennedy, just just tons of very, very talented people went through Ranscom and Company. And we, at the time, um, had, had Ranscom had a sister agency called HealthWise, which still exists, HealthWise Creative Resource Group. Um, and so all the people, all the creative people at Ranscom uh, did the did the work, the creative work for HealthWise. So I had this sort of healthcare understanding in my, in my, uh, that arrow in my quiver, I guess you could say. And um, and I went on from Ranscom to go to other consumer agencies. I became creative director, at, as you said, Sharp Blackmore Euro, working with uh, Bill Sharp and Tom Blackmore, amazing guys, brilliant guys. And um, from there, and worked on Volvo and Dell there, and some really interesting work uh, with wonderful people. And um, then from there, took a job as creative director at ACLC, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, it merged a number of years ago with, uh, I think, Zig. Um, but it was a great, and that was Mercedes and Toshiba and other really Swiss Chalet and interesting pieces of business there. Um, from there, I was a, I was, this is, I'm rattling through this, but from there, I was a, a creative director as a partner with Smith Roberts and like a boutique firm and did that for a year before the opportunity with, um, with uh, Anderson DDB came along. And Kevin Brady hired me and Frank Palmer because I had healthcare in the background, but didn't come exclusively from healthcare. And that's what they wanted as a creative director. And it was really a, a wonder, had a wonderful time there, 14 year run. And um, in the last couple of years was, was also doing dual duty as national creative director for DDB Canada, which involved, you know, uh, promoting the work and helping the other offices uh, with resourcing and doing other things like that. It was a lot of it was during COVID. So we would have, um, uh, you know, weekly uh, cross country creative chats, which were great, good way to bring all the, the different uh, people together from the different offices in Montreal and, and Vancouver and Edmonton. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a, a wonderful, interesting ride. I've been very fortunate. Um, I've worked with great clients and, uh, and great people along the way. Um, and uh, yeah, so for the last number of years, certainly uh, have a healthcare understanding, especially because I spent a lot of time in that space. I hope that answers the question. It was a bit of a long winded reply. No, it was great. It's great because I'm not sure if you've done any of their podcasts or intend to, but I mean, this is going to be here forever. So this is your legacy. You just say whatever, whatever you need to say, say it, say it now. Because, because it's always going to be there. Yeah. This is, this is when people Google Tony Miller, this will come up. So. Okay. I'll have to live yeah. with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you've had an incredible career. You mentioned uh, a couple of mentors when you were first starting out and have continued to mentor um, you and the kind of class you had of creatives that it, you've that have spread out throughout the industry that you've kept in touch with, which is so important. But um, just talk about early mentors. Was, was your father even subconsciously a mentor or was it more other people that you work with professionally who kind of mentored you? Um, I think d- dad was, um, you know, not overtly, but in the background, you know, giving guidance and advice and get a basic, you know, decency about him, which, I've tried to bring to my career and to treat people well. Um, My view is that you you treat people well on the way up because you're going to need them on the way down. Um, And it's uh, certainly examples of people who haven't done that. And and when they, when things don't go their way, there aren't people helping them. So you really do have to pay it forward. I've been lucky in that, you know, I work with very smart people, as I said, Jim Ranscom, uh, Bill Sharp, you know, Esme Carroll, Tom Blackmore, Esme was at ACLC, uh, brilliant, brilliant leader, uh, Glenn Stanley, Paul, other people that I've worked with have been terrific. And of course, Kevin Brady and, and Frank Palmer um, uh, as well, and who I, I count as friends. Uh, Gore DeVoe, who is a brilliant strategist, uh, uh, you know, in the healthcare space. So I've been really lucky along the way to to be able to learn from people and 
uh, not just creative people, but people in the strategic space and the account service space and, and listen and learn um, and, you know, absorb what they have to offer so that, you know, that you can use that in your experience when you're tackling new problems and encountering new clients. You know, there's no substitute for experience and it, it, we're continually learning in this business and learning from new clients and different problems. You think you've seen, just when you think you've seen it all, this other completely different thing that shows up and then you have to learn how to navigate that. So uh, I've been fortunate and, you know, and I think because I was so lucky being around really smart people who were generous with their time, um, I've tried to do the same thing with young people that have been coming into the business in my department and, um, and make sure I train them and mentor them and give them an opportunity uh, because really it's the only way this business gets better. And so I make it a point to answer emails, to meet with everyone who asks. Um, not everybody does that and I'm sure everybody's busy, but it's something that, that, that you know, it's important to do that. Just leave it at that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> well, over the years you, you've seen like, You've, you've, you've mentioned you, you thought you've seen everything, new things come up. The industry is always changing. The world is always changing. Can you talk a little bit about how the industry itself has changed over the course of your career? And yeah. For sure. I mean, you know, I started in the business in the late 80s, early 90s. And, you know, there weren't, there weren't computers at first, right? So that in and of itself, the dawn of that and how it started to impact the business and the creative side of things with, you know, for writers, it wasn't vastly different because it was word and you were writing in a word, but for the art directors, it was transformative. And so you would go over the years, you would go from presentations where you had tissues, like we call them tissue sessions still, but you'd have ideas up on the, up on the wall and you walk a client through those you still try to do that. Um, with rough sketches, you know, um, and headlines. And so you would articulate the idea in a few different ways for them and they would have to use their, um, their creativity too, to imagine what it could be. And what we've done is we've gone from that to more and more and more and more finished work that clients need to be shown. And uh, I, I don't know where it ends other than with just presenting finished work. You know, and that, and so you've seen that over the last you know, 25 years where it just has moved to now where new business pitches are basically clients are asking for finished work. They yeah. don't call it that. They call it, you know, you know, ad like objects, ad lobs or, you know, but really what they're asking for is as close to a finished ad as you can possibly give them in a, in a pitch. And what that means is um, a lot of time is spent crafting instead of ideating. And that's not the best thing because you're crafting work that may never see the light of day. Uh, it's not often that you present anything in a, in a pitch that actually ever runs because uh, you don't have all the information you need. Mm. Um, you know, what the client's given you and what you can glean, but you, but so you're spending all this time polishing work for the pitch to win the pitch, but it may never see the light of day. And whereas you could be spending more time working on ideas. So that's happened. And, um, you know, of course, over the last couple of years, everybody knows that that presentations aren't necessarily in person anymore. That's not a good thing. I, I think that's starting to come back because people crave face to face contact. Um, it's better for pitches. It's better for client relationships. So, you know, Zoom meetings mean that you can have more of them and they, they're awesome, but they they have their, their place. So there's that. And I think what's happened over the, and this is not maybe news to most people, but what's happened is that the agents, the way agencies are paid has changed over time. That um, used to be, uh, agencies used to be in a retainer model. They used to make money off of media. They used to buy media and make money off of that. And when that went away. Could, could you kind of explain that a little bit as far as. So how as down? best I can. Um, and, and, the, and the media portion of this, how agencies made money on commission, on media, that was leaving when just as I was getting into the business. But agencies made a lot of money on media and and that's a whole other podcast maybe you can have with someone from the media space and they can explain it in better detail. But that happened and then what happened was clients were went from a retainer model 
uh, for the business. And a retainer meant that an agency and a client would work out the scope of work for the year and an agency would be paid a, a, a monthly retainer. It allowed agencies to um, to properly staff businesses because they kind of had cost certainty. And then they would revisit those you know, a couple times a year to make sure that, that they were being they had enough staff, the client might have felt, no, you're not staffed properly, and they would tweak that. So it moved from that over time to a, um, a project basis. And what project did was it, it made it, makes it harder for agencies to staff businesses properly because they're staffing per project and projects can be taken away and then their own agencies are overstaffed and, um, uh, or added and then they're understaffed and it just makes it a lot a lot harder for agencies to properly manage their businesses. This is not a, a secret. This has been going on for a long time. And um, many people have written about this. It's really a, partly a function of the rise of procurement on the client side and procurement officers serve a function within client organizations, which is to get the best possible cost for um for their for the, for that for that client and so they they scrutinize the work that agencies are doing and the and the and the projects and the staffing and it's very prescriptive and it it tends to drive costs down which clients like but then agencies can't properly staff so there's this the rise of procurement officers in companies has had a an impact i'll say on the way agencies operate and so that has changed things too. And the last thing I'll say about this, because it's a long answer and it's a it's a complicated question, is that because of that, um, because of that that pressure on the bottom line for agencies, the training and development portion that agencies used to spend on training young staff, either creative people or account people or strategic people, media people, so and so on, has has not disappeared, but it has been really put under a great deal of pressure. So there's less time and less money to do that. And uh, and and that isn't good for juniors in the business coming into the business because there just isn't the time for agencies to properly train people. So a lot of pressures on the business and and it's had um certain impacts in the way agencies operate and function. For those listening at home, procurement is, is they basically, if you, let's say you're in a uh, automotive company, a, a automotive company has a, a dozens of suppliers for their cars. The procurement pr- people will go and negotiate with the suppliers to try to get the best price. So those same people are, are judging who is going to get the advertising account too. They know nothing about advertising, but they see numbers on a spreadsheet and they try to get it lower. So... And so you'll be in a pitch and maybe you'll be in round three of a pitch, you know, just you and another agency and, and then they'll start to negotiate. And sometimes an agency will, will, will buy the business we say and, and come in with a really low uh, price on an hourly, a blended hourly rate. And they might win the business that way. Um, just on price. Just on price. But then it's really, really hard to make for the agency to make enough money on that. And then the relationship is fraught with peril because, uh, then their the client agency isn't making enough money. They're trying to charge more to make the money they need to make. And the client is angry because they were promised this many people. And so it just puts everybody in a bind. Oh, it's depressing to think about sometimes. Yeah. I was thinking about that and I was thinking about just business, business strategies in general. And uh, as far as advertising goes, it doesn't, every business, you have to have some kind of a moat or some kind of competitive advantage. But with advertising agencies, I'm seeing, I'm not seeing a ton of competitive advantage between agencies, which is why I think the industry has consolidated so much. There's about three, I think, holding companies that own basically the entire industry. Is that correct? Well, uh, three or f- four. Four, yeah. Four or five, four, four or five big ones. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's independent agencies, right? And there's some very, very successful independent agencies, absolutely, right? Um, and the big networks, you know, they, you know, you have to report in and be profitable if you're a, a an office of those networks and there's advantages absolutely in being in a, in a big network because you can tap into network talent if you need to for a pitch and every network has its own means by which agencies local agencies can do that um independents have more freedom obviously they have more freedom in terms of um staffing and how they choose to staff um and, and what their compensation margin is that can be there's more freedom there for independent agencies there's also more risk right they they 
they have to make payroll and they have to do all of those things that and have those stressors um, as well. And they and independent agencies do try to have um, loose network affiliations with each other to help each other to a certain degree. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a rationalization going on in the industry and uh, sometimes independents get bought up by, by the networks and then sometimes networks will fold uh, a bunch of agencies into one to try to get efficiencies that way. Um, you know, offshoring is something that's happening now um, where agencies are, uh, some networks are sending, are having, for example, accounting functions or production functions that's done in other countries where the cost of labor is lower. Mm-hmm. Right. Again, trying to, and it can work absolutely. And uh, just, you know, working around the time zones, but um and that is a, an attempt by the agencies to make sure that they can remain profitable by moving work around that way. Mm, very competitive. Seems it's like very competitive. Yeah, right it's now. a really, really, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, I, I've worked in a couple of different, in, in different corporate environments, and the, the relationship between art directors and copywriters has always fascinated me. I, I, I'm a big believer in the hive mind, which I think advertising has, not just copywriters and art directors, but the entire team, strategists, account people, everyone, when they're working on accounts, seems to come together in a very kind of cohesive way to create this hive mind, which I don't see very often in other corporate environments, which are very siloed. But specifically, the art director copywriter relationship, I've never seen that in any other industry where two people are basically professionally married. And these relationships can start in school, in, in, in advertising school and continue till retirement. Sometimes they break down. Sometimes the divorces are messy. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship and your thoughts about it and things you've seen? And Yeah, I mean, it didn't used to be that way. Bill Burnback was the first one to put an art director and a copywriter together and say two heads is better than one. And that happened in the 60s in the advertising revolution. Um, and over the years, that model has, has persisted and has persisted because it works. And so... You know, you will, and and I've been in situations where we might be, there might be several of us in a room, you know, ideating together, and that can work really well. And people are just throwing ideas around, and and then you go away and work on your own a bit, or then you come back and work with an art director and a writer. I've worked with some really talented art directors over the years, you know, as I said, Lance Martin and uh, Les Seuss and and others who have been, you know, tremendous. Roger Iyer, like really, really great art directors, and and um. And it's you can't. It's hard to beat that model. And and even during um, COVID, people were worried that 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 relationship would break down. But in fact, we found in creative departments it was it worked quite well because the art director they could meet like this, and they could jam for a while, and they could go off on their own and then come back. And so that still worked. And they would occasionally meet face to face. But so that actually didn't break down. Um, and I do know in a couple of cases, I know about partnerships that have lasted a long, long time. Um, in other cases, you know, after a while, maybe the marriage gets a bit stale and, and you know, one, one art director will leave to go to another gig. It's a, this notion that teams exist and then go from agency to agency to agency is, is romantic. Uh, but uh, often an agency, when it's hiring, has a need for a copywriter or a art director, but not, a, you know, both. And so often when those things broke up, it was because a writer got offered a lot more money to go to another agency. And then, you know, they would say sorry, or she would say sorry, and that would be that. So, but still, um, there are some great partnerships out there um, where, where the, the two will get hired often as co-creative directors. That happens. Um, and, and, uh, you know, so they exist. Um, it's not exclusive. A lot of agencies move people around and try different combinations. I used to, you know, have a bit of both where I was, when I was in charge of of different departments, I would have some set teams. And in other cases, I found that some writers and art directors enjoyed it more just working with a couple of different writers or a couple of different art directors and and that can work too it keeps things interesting and and not every piece of business is perfect for every team as well so so you don't have an opinion on whether those kind of relationships should be very set you think they can be fluid move people around i think they can be fluid and they and they are by nature and by the nature of the business they have to be fluid Right. There are obviously some teams that have been together for a long time, but I'd say more often than not, not. Uh, 
over the last 15 years. Um, but, but then, you know, at, at some agencies, they have like three or four or five teams. And I, and I did in many cases have go to teams and we could talk about that in junior teams and senior teams. But, um, in some cases it was the, the best work would come from a team that had been together a long time. You just kept them together and you didn't break them up and you didn't mess with it. And so absolutely a bit of both. I know I'm hedging, but it's true. It's just a bit of both. No, that's fine. Well, I was going to, that leads me to my next question, which is advertising has, it's the one industry where it is, the product is creative people, basically. Yes. You're, you're, you say your product goes up and down the elevators at night. That's how that, that's the same. Yeah. Your, your, your product is creative brains. That's what you're selling. That's what creates the uh, output. So, and I mean, creative people are notoriously kind of weird. How, how is it managing creative people? All these, you've been doing it for so long. Talk, talk to us about the, th the things you've learned, how to do it. If you have a philosophy or not, I, I'd like to know. Well, I do. I mean, I think the job, so there's this, just to step back for a second, there's this notion in the business that the career path is you're a copywriter, then you're associate senior copywriter, then you're associate creative director, then you're creative director, then you're, you're a group creative director, and then this, and the same thing for art directors. And that is not accurate because there are people who are just fantastic writers and they should never be managing people. And same for art directors. They should never, they can't manage their way out of a paper bag and, but they're outstanding designers or art directors. And so you know, a lot of times over the years, I've seen creative people promoted beyond their ability, not as a creative person, but into a job that is that is wholly different than what they've been doing. A creative director job is is administration. It's managing people. It's managing clients. It is creating work and steering work and guiding work and picking work and cajoling to get the best work. It's all of those things. But there are some people who are just the best at ideating and writing or art directing, and they love that. And they don't want to be, they don't want to run the whole show. If they'd be bad at it, or they know they'd be bad at it, or they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be happy because they need to always be creating and, and, and coming up with the ideas and, and so on. So, you know, as a, as a, as a creative director, I've seen, you know, I've been able to manage personalities. It is not easy. Uh, there's egos involved. It's, it's like, why did this team get this job and we didn't, or I'm not on the good business. How come I'm not on the good, good, the best business. And then you have to talk to the people about why they're on the pieces of business they're on and promise them and hopefully be able to deliver better pieces of business for them to work on creative opportunity, as we say. Um, and so uh, it is that is so people management, it's client management, being able to navigate clients. Um, and it's dealing with finance and HR and all of those things. So it's a it's a, a broad role and being able to map out how you build a department and have the right pieces in place in that department. And just when you get it right, maybe a piece of business changes and then you don't have it right anymore and you have to course correct to get the right as you said, hive in place to to deliver the best work. Now, part of your question was about creative people are kooky and 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 yes, some of them. Are, I didn't say are, kooky. I said, said I said weird. I said weird. Weird to be clear, weird. And some of us are, and some of us are in some ways, and not in other ways. I think. I think the days of, you know, certainly the days of the three martini lunch and the creative people who were there in the morning and you couldn't find them in the afternoon because they were at the bar or whatever. I mean, those days are long gone. That, that, those sound I saw like great the, days, by the way. Those sound really good. Like, I, I think I got into the business just at the tail end of that. And <sighs> maybe just, you know, a few years of that and seeing that. But um, that, there's just, it doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and so, and so because of that, maybe some of the more interesting characters aren't in the business as there used to be um, because the business doesn't allow for it. I think that's, a, again, a whole other discussion about what kind of people are attracted to the business and what, what kind of people thrive in the business now. Um, so, so. Well, uh, Tony, Tony, let's talk about that for a second. You hit on something. What, what kind of the, what kind of personality type do you think thrives now as opposed to before? Well, I think, I think, you know, you, uh, I always say, you know, to anyone that'll listen, that this is an applied art. Okay. 
we can never forget that we have to sell product or service or persuade or change opinion or, you know, we have to get people to take some kind of action. And so it's an applied art. It's not a fine art. And I think some people get into the business thinking it's a fine art. They're going to throw darts at ceilings and ideate and come up with kooky things. And yeah, there is that. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to sell an idea and the idea has to move people and move merchandise it free. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So because it's a business. And so I think some people don't last in it because of that, because maybe they're even though they have interesting ideas, they can't have like their ideas don't sell, which is too bad. Um I think as well that, you know, you have to, as a creative person, be able to handle rejection and a lot of it, right? You, I learned that very early on and not everybody can get past that and it's too hard on them emotionally. And so they leave the business and get into some other other business that where they have a creative outlet or, or whatever. But, you know, you come up with 20 ideas and maybe four of them get in front of the client and maybe one of them gets sold or you have to put more, you know, the, the concept shredder, you know, like it just, you have to be able to roll with that and think that there's always a better idea. There's always another idea. There's always going to be something else that, that will, will solve the brief. Um, and if you can't get past that, you can't last in the business because it's just too emotionally draining and horrific. Right. And so I was given that advice early on and I saw it and I went, okay, I got to be able to deal with this. Um, cause not, even though you can't, you can't, even though you might think every idea is a gem, they aren't. And also you have to be able to move on to the next gem, uh, uh to be able to last. Yeah, and so absolutely. some people can't and some people don't. And, and I think, um, but the schools, and we can talk about this a bit, the, the advertising programs that the schools, uh, have are turning out really talented art directors and writers and the schools have gotten a lot better that the portfolios we're seeing are a lot better and more fully developed than they, they, they used to be. Um, and that's a good thing. And so the talent that's coming out of the agencies is, is, is terrific and, and really well-trained. Um, so that's great. Speaking frankly, do you think the, the level of creativity has changed since you started to now? Has it gotten better, worse? And how do you get to big ideas in, in your opinion? Well, I mean, that's a complicated question. I think very, there's very always been, yes, very complicated. I think there's always been terrific ideas. And all you have to do is judge one of the major award shows to see how much awesome work there is. And there's so much great work that doesn't even win at an award show for whatever reason. You know, you see, we see, you know, there's an ad show book put out. You'll see this much. There's this much that gets entered. And some of it shouldn't have been, but a lot of the work is outstanding. And doesn't win um so there's a lot of great work being produced every year and endlessly creative and so i believe that the business is as creative as it's ever been um you know and i and and that's because people are talented and people always want to do something interesting and something new even though the briefs might be similar in many cases you know two people can come up with the same idea from a brief it's very similar and people go oh well one person stole from the other but that's not the case people don't do that you know it's it's just similar briefs and similar ways of tackling the problem and it's pretty easy to see that now and someone goes oh that ad was look that ran five years ago and it's supposed to know that how, how you know so um to answer your question i think things are as creative as ever there's wonderful work being done every year how to get to great ideas and that's time and talent just throw time and talented people give them some talent time and, and the ability to recognize the idea um as well and being open to ideas being come that can come from anywhere not just your creator department strategy people have brilliant ideas account people have brilliant ideas be open to that attuned to that to going hearing someone say something in a meeting going that's an idea let me run with that and you know great insights that come from those groups um you have to be open to that and you know as i say time so it's time and talent um you have to be able to, I always tried to make the case for as big a creative department as possible because that's what we sell. We sell ideas. And if you don't have enough people in the, in the agency to come up with the ideas, you, you have no idea what you're missing. You never know what isn't there on the wall because you don't have that person there in the room that would have had something cool up on the wall um, because, you, because you had more accountants in the agency than you did uh, creative people. 
right? Well, that's so, ridiculous. Yeah. Um, it is ridiculous. Um, that's another discussion. <laughs> but that, but that is, you know, investing in the creative product is the best thing agencies can do. It is what we sell. It is what the public sees. And um, when agencies cut into that bone, into that muscle, then they do themselves and their clients a disservice. I was thinking about advertising sort of when you started, and it seemed to be the, the media landscape was a lot simpler back then. Uh, a lot of it was print-based. You know, you would present a magazine ad or a concept for a television commercial, and those were two pillars that you could hang your campaign on back in the day. Yes. Um, yes. Nowadays, I wouldn't even know where to – like, where do we start at this point in the game? It's, it's very difficult. now. Magazines don't exist anymore. Well, right, mostly. Yeah. Um, and you need good media people to, to help – figure out where those where the target audience is consuming the information. Where are they looking? Are they on TikTok? Are they Instagram? Where are they? Oh, they're on TikTok. It's online. They're, they're oh, yeah. on TikTok. <laughs> and they're and and your mom is on Facebook, right? Yes. So you, but you it's you have to know where they are and then you have to be able to be creative in the way that you reach them. Everything is content now. Um, not to say that TV including is this content. podcast by the way this, this is content, content. <laughs> but TV is still it's still TV still matters and is still important and is still the best way to reach a ton of people I could go uh, in a time machine oh really you think TV is, is the future the best so, I know. Well, well, no, listen, I could go in a time machine 50 years in the future and people would still be predicting the end of TV. When I first got into the business people were predicting the end of TV and the TV spot is going to die it's still it's hard to beat as a way to reach people who are sitting on their couch and the ad just washes over them. It's hard to beat that, you know, it, you know, content is great and we need it. And it's really important to reach a lot of audiences. And, um, and we, you know, we create that. So as I say, everything is content because the TV can also run online and it can be pushed out and it can be found through search and all of that and, and be 35 or 40 seconds long instead of 30 seconds or, you know, the UK 40 seconds or whatever. So, you know, you just have to know how to reach your, your target and be creative in the ways that you package your content and distribute it to them or allow them to find it, right? Um, so that's, that has changed. Yes, of course, it's much, sim much, much simpler before. We do a radio ad, we're going to have a double page spread and we're going to have a TV, a 30 second and a 60 and there's your campaign, you know, um, maybe outdoor, right? And so there's still outdoor, there's still some print. Uh, the print in digital form, right? Um, you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, yeah. Magazines yeah. delivered digitally, which, you know. Um, and radio is still there, though it's it's a tough, tough medium to write for. It always has been, but it's still still there and still pertinent uh, for certain pieces of business. And of course- For, uh, for those uh, listening at home who are under 30, I guess, magazines <laughs> are what the internet used to be. <laughs> They would actually buy exactly. these. You would buy the internet stands, at the drugstore. There were places you'd go and you'd bring it home and you'd read it. Yes, yeah. exactly. What's yeah. that? Um, so yes, absolutely. It's more complex, complex and fragmented now, um, and and will continue to evolve. Right? Uh, you know, you can't predict it. You can't predict no. what ten years from now it'll be. Other than I can predict that people will be saying that TV will be dead, but it won't be. But. I, I like TV. I hope it stays ah, alive, TV. personally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, which brings me to, uh, actually, it's funny you mentioned TV because the world of commercial directing, I'm fascinated by, and I'm surprised no one's done a documentary about commercial directors because there is an entire world of directors out there, Joe Pitka, for instance, um, who are enormous, in like wealthy, very famous within their industry who people have never heard about. And yeah. they get paid but they're extremely legends well. within their yeah, they're legends within their own industry, right? And yeah, and the best Joe Pick out a private plane for God's sakes. So you know, the best directors are are, you know, wonderful to work with and they bring something more than you imagined to the table to turn the spot into something lovely or something you couldn't to take it from a seven out of ten to a nine out of ten or whatever. The best are are really wonderful. And it is a craft. And a lot of, you know, sometimes art directors make that, usually it's art directors that would become directors. And, and you know, you should talk to an art director, creative director about that and, or a director about that. Um, oh yeah, I'm after lucky. this podcast, I have a friend of mine who's- You got director. another one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, because that world is, you know, and that's, a t it's, they're great and, they're, and it's tough. And, um, and the treatments that they have to put together to win a job 
are time consuming. I know that some of them have staff that help them with that. Um, but, you know, a great director can make a huge difference. A, a pedestrian director can really uh, leave a, a spot that might have been something great as, as uh, ordinary, uh, which is sad when that happens. Yeah, that's true. I've also noticed in the, I think it's the 90s or O's, the aughts, directors started using nicknames, sort of like rappers. Did you notice that? How directors started, they, they would go by Style War or Tractor or thing. They would, they would invent names and personas for themselves, like pro wrestlers, I guess. There were a few, there were a few. And I remember working one very early in my career. I can't even remember. I can't even remember who it was, but he, yeah. he flew in from LA and he was, you know, he had a cape. He was like right he on He had a cape? Capacity. Really? He had a cape and, you know, people would have to approach him. You couldn't really approach him to talk to him. You had to talk to somebody else to, or you talk to him. It was just ridiculous. I mean, My you know, it was, it was just completely silly and ridiculous. And they're much more approachable now and they're human beings. And so that sort of stuff has gone away, I think, for the most part. I hope but, so. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh man, yeah. It's 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 funny because uh, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, who is the biggest producer in Hollywood, I took a look at his career, and his career as a he was, he was he was an ad guy to start out with. Actually, he was an advertising guy, and uh, his first hit was Flashdance in the '80s. He had made some films before that, but Flashdance he used a commercial director, Adrian Lyne, and it did very well. And then if you look at his filmography, ever since then he has only used commercial directors. That's interesting. Isn't that incredible? And and Hollywood is a copycat league. No one copied him. No one realized it. No one was like, this guy's using commercial directors. He's the most successful guy out there. So well, I mean, we just did a, did a spot where we used a, a director who specialized in music video, and we used him for a spot, oh, right? Because he was able to, you know, get a lot done in one day, and had a really good eye and sense for the job, right? So you got to pull people from different specialties. Oh, absolutely. And commercial directors usually have a specialty, either comedy or drama or something. That's how it usually goes. Yes, yeah. exactly. There are comedic directors and there are dramatic directors. There are directors who specialize in you know, landscape stuff and portraiture and so on and so forth. But you were recently on a shoot with involving lions. Was, was the director a lion director? <laughs> There was a Wrangler, okay. and uh, Eric Almas was the photographer, very, very talented guy based out in California. And, and yeah, we were shooting lions and tigers and leopards out in the Simi Valley. Everything that can kill you, you were shooting. Anything that can kill you. Well, I, I, you know, I was maybe bears. 10 feet away from all of those bears. Uh, and I, I, know I said to the, uh, the account people, I said, I just have to be faster than one of you. <laughs> if something goes wrong and i was pretty confident i was just kick him so, in the shins and take him. <laughs> just just have to be faster than one but uh that was great and that was really interesting and that's part of the business that is um the fun part right is is going to different places some might say the funnest part is going on shoots that yeah that and, and it can be it's very tiring and obviously um you know more work for the art director generally than the writer oh yeah obviously um and but those are the things, the, the fun part of the business certainly is going to different places and shooting stuff and seeing places you wouldn't otherwise have seen, meeting people you wouldn't otherwise have met. And that's a, a part of the business I hope never goes away. Yeah, I hope so too. That's a, that's, that's a fun thing to do going on, uh, going on shoots. Um, let's talk about pitching clients for a second. Um, I assume you've seen every possible scenario of pitching clients. What have you learned? What can you impart on our listeners about how to pitch clients? Well, I mean, that's a, that's, it's a big question. I know that. Sometimes pitches go really well and there, there's only a couple of rounds and there's a real connection with the client and you win. And the work's good or the ask is good and you win the pitch um, because they – and sometimes a, a client will not ask for creative work. That's a different discussion. Um, they'll just ask for strategic thinking or they'll just ask for case studies. Um, and agencies will go in and present those. And, and it's always a chemistry check. Really, the client's trying to see if they get along with you and they like your thinking and they like the people in the room. So often you can do everything right and you just don't win because you they like someone else more, right? They had a better connection with another agency that went in, whether the work was better or not. Or maybe they weren't even showing work in the pitch. So it is, you know, you can do your homework. You make sure you, you answer the, the brief of the pitch. Um, what, what becomes problematic for agencies is when pitches become round one goes around two goes around three goes around four that's when it becomes 
like a poker game and for an agency and they're just they put so much money into it that they 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 can't they kind of have to push all their chips in because they've already invested so much time um in the in the pitch and then it's gone from four agencies to two agencies and then you know so those can be really exhausting and demotivating for for staff if they're not managed properly by the agency management um but those are things and some people love pitches some people don't love pitches um you know a clients are as i as i said uh, earlier with respect to procurement some clients are you know pretty good about asking an appropriate amount of work to solve the, the problem and the ask and others ask for too much. Um, pardon me. They ask for too much and they, and they ask for really what you're doing when you're doing a pitch is you're trying to get this work done in extra time because you still have your existing clients. So you can't let your existing clients know that you've been pulled away from their business. They shouldn't be pulled away from their business to work on this pitch to get new business. You had an agency you know, is like Kevin Brady used to say, it's like a funnel. There's always stuff dripping out the bottom and you have to keep filling the funnel because business goes away for reasons beyond your control. Maybe there's a global realignment uh, from head office says, you know, now we are running all of the business out of X country or Y country. And then you lose the, lose business you were doing good work for. And then you have to replace that business. And um, so you're constantly having to pitch the, the, the thing that, agencies do generally and i think most of them do this is have a kind of a pitch checklist to see if the if the client opportunity matches that checklist and ticks enough boxes do we have experience in that category whatever the category happens to be have we done work with this client before so we have a master's services master service agreement with the client so that if we win we can actually work on it as opposed to lawyers having to work on a master service agreement for six months you know, um, do, does the client have a good reputation? Um, do they pay their bills on time? Um, is it the kind of work we want to do? You know, so there's all of these things that, you know, all agencies, I think, would have as a checklist to to say, should we even go in and pitch it, pitch the business in the first place? And then they try to find out, agencies try to find out how, what's the long list, you know? It's a long list, 15 agencies, you know, that are all submitting things. And then, you know, you go from a long list to a short list. Um, if the if the RFP isn't a ton of work, and then it's okay then to have a lot of agencies that are on that long list and the client and the, maybe the consultant they've hired or whoever can get down to five agencies that can come and do a face-to-face meeting. Maybe there's one more round after that. That seems reasonable to me. Uh, then you've done you've done a face to face presentation and they liked you enough they want to see you in one other agency that seems reasonable and fair and then you know agencies haven't invested too much time and they've they've um, done their best work and been able to do that without while still servicing their existing clients. Well, sometimes it just seems like you're in The Bachelor, an episode of The Bachelor, where oh, the client well, is I mean, just like, oh, well, let's see what you have to say. Oh, honestly, see what you honestly, have to say. I've left. I've left pitches thinking we've got this and we haven't i've left pitches thinking there's no way we won that and we did there's honestly it's a mugs game guessing you can't know um because you don't really know what um the playing field you don't know if the playing field is level whenever you enter you try to see if it's a level playing field but you don't know if you're there as column fodder as they say in the sales business are you just there because they needed five agencies and you tick a box and then you're there and then someone says look i I had five agencies and I just happened to pick the one where my friend works. Right? <laughs> Which happens Honestly, a lot, by the way. It happens a lot, right? You never really know. You know, you try to know, but you never really know if it's a level playing field. You hope it is. And then if you lose in a level playing field, so be it, right? Yeah, that happens in uh, job interviews too, where you think, why am I sure. in this job interview? I don't know anyone in this agency. How do that even, you realize, oh, they already have someone picked up, but they just need to bring more candidates in totally. here. I mean, that's, business. And, yeah, that's business. So, you know, you try to have a ratio of success on pitches and then every agency has a different ratio of success. You know, you pitch 10, you win two out of 10, that's pretty good, or three out of 10, that's really good. You know, so there's just a, it's a volume game. Um, Often. Yeah, and then you can go on a run, and then you can, then you'd be like, well, we don't need to pitch anything anymore. We need to just tend to our knitting, and then we don't pitch anything more for a while, which is a great place to be if you're in an agency that's had that kind of success. 
Yeah, it's it's not often talked about. Uh, the agency client relationship, I believe, is down to the average is eighteen months now. Is it? I think it's down to eighteen, less than two years. It's it's down to now, which has been decreasing since it's been keeping track of. So well, and there, I don't know. I'd love to know what the reasons for that are. I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, I, I know that the average shelf life of a CMO, chief marketing officer, is about eighteen months. That's probably it then. That That's, lines up. Yeah, the CMO job is very tough, and you know. That's why that has a revolving door on it because the president can go, well, I changed the CMO and then they let their CMO go and then they hire a new CMO and then the CMO says, well, one thing I can change is the agency. I'm going to call an agency review and then that happens and then, right? And so you can see how that cascades down. Um, but eight, but as a client relationship, 18 months is short. That's not great. Yeah, not great. Uh, a little bit longer in pharma, I believe, because there is such a long uh, life cycle in products. Uh, right, and so in and the pharmacy and the healthcare side, you have more certainty because because as you just said, that product has a certain. You know that you have it for the project generally, and that project can last three or four years, mm -hmm. which is great because you can make money during that time, do good work, and then you know that it's coming to the end of its life cycle, and then you can be pitching new business and new products in advance of that. And so there is, yes, definitely more certainty there. Uh, did you want to comment at all on, I, I think pharma advertising, uh, the overall pie of advertising spend, I think pharma is almost half now. It's it's getting up there as far as overall spend goes. It's, um, and it's interesting work, uh, I would say. So it's it tends to be recession proof or more so um, because people are always needing these products. Um, and uh, so, and the work is interesting. If you've worked in, as I did in a lot of consumer businesses over your career, and when you come to healthcare work, it's 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 interesting work. You're helping people with you know you're you're helping to communicate valuable medicine and solutions to people. So that's edifying um, in a way that another beer may not be, or another telco or whatever. Um, so, uh, but it requires a certain maturity. Uh, you have to have you know seen a lot i think to work in that space and know that there's that it's tough uh that there's rules and regulations in place um and that you have to be able to do work that is within that that corridor of what's acceptable and each country has different rules and regulations um but that can be good too because you know where the parameters are and you can play within those so um it's yeah, really I mean, an enjoyable it's, area to work in for sure yeah, structure is actually pretty good for creative type people. Have it given them parameters. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> people like structure, just like your kids. You know, kids need structure. They, they say they do. The but they do. Yeah. They, they, they actually want some rules. Yes, you know? they and do. So, for creative people to have some rules, it's not a bad thing because mm -hmm. um, it can, you know, it can actually lead to some really spectacular work. I and mean, just go look at the, you know, London International or Clio's or Con and, and the health and wellness space, and the work is tremendous. It's wonderful yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is there any work that you've done or you've seen that has really impressed you lately? Maybe you can toot your own horn if you want to, or just toot someone else's horn. Well, I know I don't want to. I don't really want to comment on that. There's so much great work being done that you know, and I don't. You know, I, I look at the shows and I like when I judge it and be judging another show in a little while, and I like and that work stays with me for a while, and you know, then I you know then we're on to the next thing. Um, I know that one of the, because there's just too much, you know, like when I pick three things and someone will go, well, I didn't like that ad or I really love that. Or and everyone used to say the same thing. Well, I really like the Apple ad. I really like Nike advertising. Oh, yeah. But there's some marvelous work that does stay with you over the years. And I, I, I just think the stuff that the, those things are more timeless, but it is a subjective business and what might appeal to one person doesn't necessarily appeal to another. I think one of the things you wanted to ask me was, um, you know, is there some other, some ads you've come up with that didn't get to run? And, and I think I, I sort of addressed that a little bit earlier, which is that if it didn't get to run, it didn't run and it's not, and you have to forget about it. Right. Like you see, it's, it's like that girl you hit on who shot you down. Don't bother thinking about it. Just move on. The only time you can come up with an idea that's going to run and work backwards to find a product to it is before you have a job and you're putting your student book together. Mm -hmm. So I say to the, to, uh, to young people is you come up with a cool idea i'll help you find a product for it and you can put it in your book right you can't do that ever again once you've gotten to the business but uh that's why you know some student books are really outstanding because they're full of great ideas for products and then they pick the product that it worked for so 
Um, but when you do judge shows, you see just how much wonderful work there is that is that is out there. And, and, and that's why I have a lot of hope for the industry because there's always new minds coming to the business and, and people that have been in it for a long time and still have wonderful ideas. I know we have this notion in advertising that is purely fed by young brains coming in and that the business can be a bit ageist and it, and it, it can be because of financial pressures. Right. Um, and, yeah. and so, but it's, why in this business do we think someone who's been in for a certain period of time is no longer creative is a mystery to me because some of the best novelists didn't do their best work until they were 60 or 50 or, you know, 48 or 53 or whatever. And so there's no reason that this business can't be the same way. It is just that it's a, you know, that the financial model has to work right for agencies, which is why there's you know a mix and this is something else we can talk about at some point but it's the mix mm-hmm. of what that goes into that creative department and how you staff it with the money that you have from the from, from agency management to be able to put that team together based on what your billings are and how do you fit those pieces together so that it makes sense well uh let's just talk about that for a second the agency model is a billable hours model which is similar to law and i think consulting do you have a love hate relationship with it? Are you, do you like it? Do you not like it? What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's 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 in place by necessity because of the way that project it's but because clients are doing project work, right? Scope the scope of work would be fifty projects, and and so that's how you have to you know build these projects. But what what happens at agencies and what I've seen happen is that there's this tension between what the compensation metric that is demanded from head office is. So that you know, how much you're allowed to spend on salary, right? So that compensation metric versus the number of people available in the department to build the hours to hit the number, right? So those two things are in tension. And um, I've seen situations over the years where where it was really hard to get the accounting department to understand that there's two sides to that coin. If you don't have the people in place to build the hours, to hit, to make the money, to get it into the agency, you're not going to have that compensation metric work anyway. Or it becomes an accounting death spiral because they keep pressing the compensation margin down and then you're making less money because there aren't many people in the agency to build the hours to make the money. And then that, and then it just goes until there's like one person left at the agency turning out the lights. This is a constant tension within the business. Um, Can that change in some way? Is, is there a better way to do it? Because it does seem, like you like you said, it does turn into a death spiral. Well, it can. And, and I think some agency networks are better at understanding that than others. Um, and independents don't have that same issue because they aren't run by their accounting departments. And so you just have to have that. You have to be wide eyed about that and understand that that um, those pressures to deliver, you know, the sense of the holding companies is to deliver profit. Right. Fair enough yep. uh, to 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 get shareholder value again. Fair enough. But just understand that that the constant I guess if it's only focused on that, at some point you don't have the people to do the work. Yes. Right. And if you don't have the people to do the work, you can't bill and you can't make the money and get the money into the agency. Right. It's it's not like you're trying to get a, a lower cost on a fender to make your overall cost. These, these are people, they're creatives, they're. Yeah. And I'm not, and I'm not like... pointing fingers at any particular holding company or anything. I think that these all, these are just business pressures and the people that are, that are, that are in place to to make sure those numbers work. Their job isn't easy. And I'm not suggesting that it is, right? Because they that they've got a job to do and they have to deliver certain numbers. And so it's just as a creative director, you are you are witness to that in certain cases, and you're trying to fight for people and and resource and making those cases. And sometimes you win those discussion arguments, and sometimes you don't. And so it goes. Well, do you think that gives independent agencies an advantage, a competitive advantage? Well, sure it does. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you know, many people believe that independents have a leg up in that way, for sure. You know, they may not have as many resources to pull on through a network, right? Uh, but yeah. they have, and so they have certain freedom in other ways, right? So networks have their advantages. I, 
I like working for networks. I don't have a problem with it. I've worked for independents and I've worked for networks. I have no issue working working with networks uh, because you can pull into you can pull in resource from other offices and and incredibly talented people from around the world and offer that service to your clients. Whereas you can't do that at an, at an independent. So you know there's a tendency to romanticize uh, the independent agency, but they don't have the same resources that a big network might have. Right? They have certain freedoms in other ways. 100%, but um, they also don't have uh, access to the resources that a network agency would. That's very true. It's, uh, it's a really interesting business, um, unlike any other, honestly. It's just, it's, uh, there's independence, there's con- con- conglomerates, there's, it's unusually structured, it changes all the time. It's just, it's, it's always moving. But it's endlessly interesting. And, you know, my dad used to say that a bad day in advertising is better than a good day in a lot of other businesses. And that's because every day is different. You know, if yeah. you're not going to some assembly line, you're not just tightening a bolt on a widget and, you know, you're, it's always different. You're always learning. You know, I see it's a great business for people who have ADD because as soon as you're, as soon as I'm, I'm convinced it's, well, probably most of us, as soon as you're an expert on one thing, you can forget about it and, and move on to the next project. And then you become an expert on something else for a period of time and then you move on to something else and you're gaining experience along the way and knowledge. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV sort of thing, you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting business that way. It's, it's an interesting way to make a living for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, talk about uh, let's let's give some advice to the young folks out there who are considering a, a, a job in, in advertising or career in advertising. Say they're creative writer, maybe an art director. What would you say to them at this point in the game? Well, I would say try to get into an agency that um, where there's someone that can mentor you, take your take you under their wing, and spend some time with you, and where there's people to look to to learn, so that you can see. You know, I really feel badly for the people that came in, the young people that came to the business during COVID because they were like, it was like, welcome to advertising. Now sit at your kitchen table alone, you know, and it was really horrible for them. But now people are starting to go back into the office and that's really important for agency culture. So try to get into a place that has that where they where they want to be in there from time to time, not always, but they want to be in there. And so you can learn from people, be around people that have experience so that you can watch and learn uh, through osmosis um and then you'll you'll be able to see and then you know don't get stuck in one place if you're if you're on one account for a couple of years you know that's great and then try to get experience in another piece of business or another agency sometimes people young people move for more money because it's the only way to be able to get more money often it's hard to get raises at certain agencies and that's just the way it goes um so that's why there is movement I think young people today coming into the business are less loyal in that respect. They're more prepared to go, I'm going to be here for a year and I'm going here and so on and so forth. I used to say, show on your resume that you can stick around for a few years. I do believe that because if if you're hiring and you see someone with six months, six months, one year, six months, my my takeaway from that is that either they left because they're not loyal at all and they're not going to be here for more than a year or six months, or they left because they couldn't get along with people. So just be mindful of that, I would say. Mm-hmm. You know, make sure you get into a situation, stay there a while, learn. And when you're not learning anymore, go. If you're still learning and that creative director is able to give you different pieces of business to work on and the agency has enough work and they move you around and train you a bit, then stay. Don't leave for the sake of it. I think I've squeezed all the information out of you. And is, is there anything else you'd like to sp- speak on? You're a great follow on LinkedIn. Do you want to throw some plugs out or anything like that? You can find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, but I mean, you've asked good questions, and I, and I hope I've given interesting answers. And people can uh, certainly reach out to me if they have any questions on LinkedIn. And, and if, if anything I've said is they disagreed with, I'm happy to have a discussion that way, too. Yeah, he will argue with you on LinkedIn if you disagree with him. Yeah, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't want it to turn into like some hellscape, some Twitter hellscape. But yeah, uh, I'm happy to have a conversation. All right. Well, well, one. I have a series of questions to end this off, which I'm going to copyright. So here it is. Um, I just no. I'm sorry. Here we go. So, one podcast, one album, one book, one movie, one food. So one podcast, you know, the podcast I listen to now is the Guardian Football Weekly podcast because it's about it's hilarious 
and it's about English, the English premiership. And it is a riot. The guys are hilarious and the gals that are on it are really funny. It's highly entertaining. So I recommend that. So what okay. was the second one? Book. What was the second one? Book. Right now, I, I have a daughter who is going to school in um, in Scotland. My youngest is going to school at St. Andrews in Scotland. So I'm reading all kinds of Scottish history books. I'm reading about the Battle of Culloden right now. So that's what I'm. That's what's on my nightstand. And I bought um, uh, two old copies of the Diary of Samuel Pepys that I'm also that I also have there mm-hmm. from the 1800s um, that were produced then. And so I, I'm, you know, reading some interesting stuff. I'm all over the map, spy stuff, everything. No, uh, your brother was a writer, is he not? Uh, my middle brother has written a couple of books. Yes, John okay. Miller has written like two or three books. And so he's a writer also. So, uh, so uh, I, always said, I always said I got published more as well. I say. <laughs> yeah, screw you. Was it a name John? John, hey, in your face, John. That's right, John. Um, so then what was after book? Uh, album, movie, food. Uh, album, I... Or song. If you can't think of an album, you can you can drop a song. If you, you know, I I one of my first albums I listened to was Elton John. My parents had that around the house when I was a kid, and they had some of his work. So I'm a big Elton John fan, and so you know, Man Man Across the Water, you know, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, all that stuff. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that kind of genre and stuff. But I listen to new stuff too. So oh, expand he- my horizons. Elton John is great because he was part of a creative creative partnership. Him and his songwriting partner, Bernie Taupin. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah brilliant yeah. lyricist. Yes, yeah. exactly. There you go. Um, so book. Then uh, uh, let's let's go movie and food. Movie. Okay, so we just saw a. Um, well, the, first of all, I could watch Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. I've watched it like four times. It came out a few years ago, based on the John Le Carre novel. Unbelievable movie. Brilliant art direction, uh, brilliant dialogue. So I recommend that if you haven't seen it. I've seen it three times, and I still don't under. I still can't follow the plot. Follow the plot, right? No. So no, it's fantastic. And the Banshees of Inisherin. I just watched that. With my wife. Oh, and that's, right. That's uh, there's some Academy Award perform- recently. Yeah, uh, some wonderful sure. performances in there. Uh, amazing performances. So that's that's worth watching too. All right, food. And it's good. Food. What food do I like? Just, just what, whatever. Just if you're into it now, if you uh, comfort food from the past, just give me, give me a food. Uh, ribeye steak, Tonya. Well, what's on the side? What's on the side? Um, uh, mashed potatoes. Like really, honestly, man. Like I'm just rare. We're going rare. Interesting. Medium rare. Medium rare. rare. Yeah. Right. So, so that's not you know that's not very fancy, but it's I got to tell you that if that were my last meal, that would be the. That's right. Sounds good to me. Uh, I'm not big on the steak, but I will eat one every now. And your, I like watching your your other podcast stuff where you make Indian food. Oh, that was that's actually a YouTube channel where I make. Oh, food. YouTube. Okay, yeah. there you go. I like watching that because I like Indian food as well. And so I was like, I showed my wife. I said, this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, more to come as far as Indian food oh, goes. Okay. Um, Excellent. Yeah, I'll get my dad and my mom making some more food oh, uh, on absolutely. the channel. Can't wait. But. but uh, uh, Tony Miller, Advertising Brain on the Business Brains podcast. Thank you so much for your time, Tony. We really appreciate you. Absolute pleasure, Paul, and I uh, look forward to seeing you again. Glad All we right. Do this. Thanks a lot, Tony. And uh, we will talk to you next time on the Business Brains podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good day. Mm-hmm.